Good afternoon, ladies and germs. It is Glenn Kyle. <laughs> and Marie Walker. Here to talk today about American vaudeville, mm -hmm. something that is a word that most people recognize, and they would certainly recognize a lot of the the theatrical performances and a lot of the jokes and a lot of the, the themes that run through vaudeville, but they may not actually know exactly where it came from. So we're here today to talk a little bit about that. And a couple of caveats first. As we uh, go through the presentation, we're going to show you some images and some videos, but sadly, these are not actually from the true days of vaudeville. Vaudeville is a live performance and really... Mm. Predate, formally, it predates mm -hmm. motion pictures uh, and the ability to, to, re to record uh, video and sound, for that matter. But there was, it was such a hugely popular genre that a lot of it carried over into the, the movie scene. So oh, we yeah. still have a lot of, of, of what vaudeville was, and it hugely influenced cinema. But, but true vaudeville, unfortunately, can no longer be replicated. Mm -hmm. So... We're going to jump right into it, and we'll go to our first slide. So we have to take you again back to a time before any sort of movies, motion pictures, <laughs> recorded sound, right? There's no recorded sound, so take out everything that you're used to. We're used to seeing amazing blockbuster films and listening to songs whenever we want to just by flipping on the radio or, or I'll age myself, putting in a CD <laughs> and listening to that, but... Such was not the case in the post-Civil War world, or the pre-Civil War for that matter. People needed entertainment. They wanted to see things they hadn't seen before. And so there was a huge call for such a thing. And of course, after the American Civil War, there is a huge movement of urbanization where people are moving from rural areas into the cities. And this is, this is white people, this is black people, this is everyone, not everyone, a lot of people. <laughs> Are going in, and we have a lot of immigration that has taken place too. And so the urban areas are really the the core beginnings of vaudeville because that's how people got entertained. They couldn't turn on the radio, they couldn't turn on the television because they didn't exist. Because they didn't exist, <laughs> and so they had to go see something. And so what vaudeville was, in its simplest essence, was a variety show. Mm -hmm. And they traveled around. Uh, some some of them in the cities would sort of have the same show, and you would. Uh, there would be several theaters in town that would sort of have the same show, and you could kind of rotate through and go see each vaudeville show. And they had all kinds of acts. Um, this here, this is a, uh, the one behind us is an early poster for a vaudeville for performance, and you can see what's, what's the highlight. It's animals, right? It's elephants because, wow, an elephant has come to my town. That's something I've never seen in the flesh before. So people are going to actually pay good money to go see an elephant. And we'll go to the next slide. And the next slide is really neat because it is also a poster for a vaudeville show. But when you look at it closely, you can see that this poster really contains all, um, I'll go out on a limb and say all the elements that uh, that vaudeville consisted of. So, so look through there. Marie, what do you see? Well, let's start off with the ballerina up there in front who is dancing with a clown. Uh, behind them, we have another lady with a fan and another clown, um, some acrobatics, some juggling, um, the, the dogs wearing a hat Always in the, the dogs front, with the, hats. the animal. Um, I see, uh, let's see, what else do we got there? Um, an accordion. We have an accordion. Some live music. Uh, and of course, a, a minstrel, a minstrel performer yes. back there with a black face. And we'll get back to, to that in a second, too. Yes. But, but the, that's the great thing about this poster is it sort of, in, in one document, encapsulates all the different aspects of what a vaudeville show could be. It would, and it could be, <clears throat> well, it's a variety show. It's a wide variety of things, and producers would just sort of put things together. So uh, we have a video that we want to show you. It's a, it's, a, it's a few minutes long, but it's one of the earliest videos that, that I've been able to find, we've been able to mm -hmm. find, that kind of give a hint as to what some of these early vaudeville shows would be. And Libba, when we play that, um, is it going to have that video or is it going to have us? Oh, um, it'll just be the video. It'll just be the video. Okay, well, just go ahead and, and take a look at this video and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. Okay.
So you can see there is a, a lot of variety in what can be offered in a vaudeville show. What did you see there? You saw animal tricks because mm -hmm. everyone loves oh, animal yes. tricks, right? Puppies and monkeys and elephants and cats. And, and it was a classic gag. And by the way, the word gag comes from vaudeville. It's like a thing to do. If the animal wouldn't do the trick at first, the, the, uh, sometimes the animal sort of wrangler didn't want the animal to do it at first because it built suspense, right? So if the animal couldn't get the trick right and they went off stage and he's like, you know, I bet we can get that right again, folks. You want to see it? And they're like, yeah, yeah, bring it back out and let's see it. And it got the crowd revved up. And then when the animal did the trick, theatrical genius, right? <laughs> uh, there were acrobatics. You saw acrobatics. You saw neat tricks like the, the bicycle lady, um, even the, the ball and umbrella, right? This weird stuff, but that's going to amaze people, and it's all live. Remember, that's the thing. You, you, you were having to hear the, the plinky piano <laughs> because this was being what we have as a video that would be shown in a silent movie theater, mm -hmm. but you're watching these things live, and it's gonna, just going to be a raucous. And those, and those two, there, there were two scenes with two different guys, the one with a bag full of stuff. And again, that's, mm -hmm. just, you know, that's just hilarious when it, <laughs> people making a mess is hilarious. And then the... Uh, the, the the two stereotyped Irishmen. I don't know if you, if you picked up on that. Those very leprechaun looking fellows. Um, the having having Irish participation and representation in vaudeville became very important because a lot of the immigrants into the urban areas that were going to see these shows were the Irish, right? So so that that video kind of gives you an idea about what were in some of those shows. Now, you notice that that one scene towards the end with the man with the three ladies in his boudoir, if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that burlesque uh, did become a fairly popular aspect to some vaudeville. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that because a lot, a lot of the, uh, the, the audiences would be working men, mostly men, and they would want to see these. And and there were efforts that, and we'll talk about this in just a second, how they tried to kind of clean it up and, and classy it up so that it would change. So we can go to the next slide, too. Um, I borrow this from Marie. She was looking to get into vaudeville. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, vaudeville was the biggest theatrical hit. That's how you made it. So people who were aspiring performers needed to know how to get into vaudeville. Uh, so there were, there were guides like these. And going to the next slide... Um, you can see that at, at the bottom there, it's refined vaudeville. So there was a movement to, uh, to, to make it friendly yeah. for uh, maybe not families, but at least women. Because mm -hmm. a lot of vaudeville also, and where the burlesque kind of came out of as well, was these bars would have like shows that they would then bring in and have bar entertainment like you do today. You have different bands. Um, but back in the day, you might have something that's, you know, more of a variety than someone who just sang. But of course, you know, also in vaudeville, you have singers as well. But that's also why people wanted to clean it up and classy it up a bit because a lot of times, if unless you're, in, you know, generally a working class man, you wouldn't necessarily go to those those rowdy kind of bars where these uh, shows were taking place. So then you try to clean it up, class it up. So then more classes and uh, ladies as well as perhaps sometimes children or maybe teenagers, perhaps, right. um, younger people. I don't think you would necessarily you know, bring your three-year-old to a show like this, perhaps, but I guess that was up to the show and the family. Uh, making it more reputable uh, is those kind of things, which then made it even more popular because then you had a wider audience that was participating that could go see all of these things. Right, right. And uh, I apologize. I think we might have gotten one of my slides out of order, but we can go to the one of the theater just so people can see. I think that's the next one after that. I didn't mean to get it. Yeah, that one. So you can see on the, the billboard outside, this is a vaudeville show, and you can see the people lined up to go see this. Mm -hmm. This one also has the added benefit of a pic of a photo show, right? So maybe some Ooh. the very early days of the motion picture because a theater – its goal is to fill the seats. It is not to necessarily um, have the latest thing. It is not necessarily to give new acts a break. They're filling seats so they can make money. So vaudeville goes from about 
70, maybe the mid 60s, uh, up until really the advent of motion pictures in a popular basis, the, like the 19, late 1910s and especially the 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, and one, and we can probably go back to the one that the, the screen you had put into. We, yes, we, we mentioned minstrelsy, and minstrel shows uh, were very, very popular in America. They were really the first. Um, American form of entertainment, truly, purely American. Uh, they were also particularly racist. They were built around white people putting on blackface and taking on what they uh, presented as the heirs of African American, the heirs, A-I-R-S, uh, of African American culture. And that continued through all the way up, really, to, to quite recently. But this one, this is a movie poster, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So this is... Um, incredibly uh, a bunch of incredible amazing actors who are fighting the stereotypes that were put in by the ideas of minstrel shows and such who refuse to give in to those stereotypes and this is the first like i'm not sure necessarily movie but it's the first musical that is starring all african-american uh, participants, all American, African American actors, particularly the Nicholas brothers, who were huge in vaudeville and the most amazing dancers that hopefully we will be able to see in just a little while, as well as uh, well, you you can see all of their names right there. Um, <clears throat> so, African American singers, dancers, uh, really finally getting the spotlight after um, a very long history of being pushed aside as either characterizations or not being able to participate due to segregation of course this is 1943 segregation is still in place which makes this an even larger accomplishment uh that 20 this because this movie was produced by 20th century fox in the 1940s it came out in 1943 so you, right on the well i guess the middle of world war ii yeah you have yeah. um when as as war does it brings about a lot of change uh you have, you know, women going into the workforce, and then you also have, it creates more opportunity for people who are usually uh, on the, uh, on the forced fringes. onto the fringes. Yes, yes. And, and yeah, wartime definitely exacer not exacerbates, accelerates is the word I'm looking for, social change. Yes, yeah, so in Stormy Weather, we, we see some of that. We also see all of these vaudeville for porn for performers going into the silver screen of movies, which really basically Hollywood killed vaudeville is <laughs> the uh, whole idea and a lot of these vaudeville performers sometimes make it big in Hollywood and sometimes they don't and it's just a coin flip yeah. uh, it was really hard for the Nicholas brothers particularly who we're going to talk about in a little bit uh, more because yeah. no yeah let's, let's let's hold off on them so the one you were just yeah. on the, the two images because this is 43, and really uh, the minstrel shows began in the 1830, 1830s and 40s. So this is 100 years so after this is, this that. Is, yeah, this is 100 years. So if, if we go to So yeah, now we're we going to time slide, travel back. <laughs> yeah, time travel back. So this is, you know, minstrel shows were, um, they were incredibly popular. Like I said, it was America's first real, and maybe there's a lot of symbolism in that, America's first own real entertainment extravaganza um and at first it was uh mostly white entertainers putting on blackface but then eventually african americans also sort of began to take part in the minstrel shows especially after the civil war and they became outlets for for opportunities for folks who hadn't had those especially after the civil war they would go north and there were several different troops that would travel around the north and in the northeast that became incredibly popular uh and from that tradition if we go to the next one Next slide, one of the big ones was Burt Williams. Uh, you can see him there on the left um, as in his, you could say, his street clothes. And then on the right as his vaudeville performer. And, you know, one of the great interesting things is that he was really good at we, what we today would call mime. It was, it was physical movement. It was comedy. And the thing that, that Mr. Williams did that a lot of other uh, minstrel performers couldn't do was to give his performance a very, very subtle and human touch. And he became one of the most 
fantastic stars in, in all of America for, for white and black audiences. And, and W.C. Fields himself, one of the great comedians, said that this, that this guy was the funniest man that he ever knew. And he had all these, these great gags. And, and at first he did. He, 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 like the white performers, put on black, he put blackface on his own skin um, to portray it. And then when he decided to not do that, it was sort of a shock for the audiences because in not doing the blackface, it turns out that doing blackface, he had darkened his skin beyond what his color actually was. And he continued to be this fantastically big star. But Burt Williams was one of those, those people who were on the cusp of, of minstrelsy, of vaudeville, and really of motion pictures. Um, and we can go to the, yeah, to go to the next slide. So here we have the Nicholas brothers again, and this is, uh, this is them as children. They were started out as a brother and brother kind of kid act, and kid acts were huge in vaudeville. It was kind of like your the animals we saw earlier. Everyone loved it when little kids tap danced, and everyone loved it when little dogs did little tricks, and people the other performers would sometimes feel perhaps threatened by the either children and or dog performers and they would think that they were probably going to get bumped up or out of the lineup because you only have so many acts your acts only lasted 10 minutes if you went over you got fussed at with the hook right the little the gag <laughs> yeah, hook they, that they, they, they use they, they, they actually use that that's where that comes from as well vaudeville Everyone <laughs> has brought us so many forms of entertainment and things that we don't even like. I'll be here all week. Yeah, probably. You know, uh, things like that. Or you save the best for last, um, even though it's not actually last. Last. No one wanted to go dead first. And no one wanted to go dead last because if you went first, no one was really there yet and no one was paying attention. So you really wanted to go like next to last. That was the most coveted mm -hmm. spot. And you want to get put farther in the lineup because it basically started out with the worst or not as not as good. <laughs> and then it went down to the best for second to last. And then the last one, sometimes people would hire specifically bad acts so people would leave the theater. Because people, they wanted to get people out because this is all about turning over seats. You want people to get out so you can get the new crowd in and you can do the right. show again. Or put, do whatever other entertainment you were doing. So not that they were always specifically bad acts. That was perhaps uh, the choice of the theater director if they wanted to actually hire a specifically bad act. Um, sometimes they were just the not as good acts. <laughs> but yeah, so a kid act, if you go to the next slide, you can see them as... Uh, as young adults, and they, and they continue. Yeah, they continue to dance, and again, they made uh, that transition from live performance from vaudeville uh, through to motion pictures. And I want you to notice that they, in everything they did, they never took on the persona of blackface. Mm -hmm. They never did the, the the raggedy slave. They were in in tops and tails the entire time, their entire career. They highly refused to be stereotyped like that, and sometimes they felt like that limited them in their career because people wanted the stereotype. Right. Uh, Hollywood wanted them, perhaps, to play these characterizations of people that looked like them, and they thought that that was awful and abhorrent, and they wanted to be themselves, uh, and they... No one necessarily knows for certain unless you like you know build a time machine of like what opportunities they were denied. Uh, of course, we know they were denied opportunities, but it's just not which ones. Uh, we just yeah exactly. We you can't say which ones you they were specifically denied um, because they they were so limited in what they could do, and also limited in the sense that they refused to play these characterizations, and they only wanted to do perhaps. Uh, Real work. Yeah. And and, and we're going to go to this, this clip, and when you see what they're able to do, you'll see that they don't need any sort of characterization Amazing. at all.
amazing. I can't do that. I can't even <laughs> pretend that I dream that I can do that sort of thing. That is that is talent. That is work. Um, that is one of the best dance scenes in cinematic history, if not the best. Right. And, and, and they're doing this live, right? It, I mean, well, before before movies mm-hmm. as performers, they're doing this live all the time, and it's yeah, and it's amazing. So so yeah, song and dance is an incredibly central, important part of, of vaudeville. Mm-hmm. But there, um, you know, and there's and there's there's one other character I want to mention too. If we can go to, I think the next slide, mm-hmm. um, this fellow. Um, let me make, Bill Bill Robinson. Um, he was also a very popular actor. Made the transition. Uh, from from vaudeville to, to screen, and I've put Shirley Temple here with him because again he was a big star. And this is he. How many films did he make with Shirley Temple? Four, like four or five. And they and they got along great. And this was the first interracial dance scene in all of cinema, cinema history between between the two of them, and um, got him you know all sorts of. Uh, uh, accolades and things like mm-hmm. that, but but so and you know song and dance and everything. But then there's also the uh, there's just the guys telling jokes and 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 for me personally, that's probably my my favorite part of vaudeville is just those those back and forth those teams. So we go to the next slide and we can see, you know, some of the greats. You've got up there in the upper left hand corner, you've got W. C. Fields, and then you've got uh, George Burns and Gracie Allen. Uh, a lot of you may remember them. Um, and, and lower right hand corner, you can see uh, the same gentleman we were talking about before. And then I threw the Three Stooges in because they were a, they did some stuff in vaudeville. But if you want to see something that is within the popular consciousness, that uses a lot of vaudeville jokes, a lot of vaudeville uh, comedy, there are almost entire episodes of Three Stooges where they don't need to say anything to each other. Right? They're just doing the physical comedy which could be an important part of live vaudeville performances because in these urban areas, you have all these different uh, immigrant groups coming to watch the shows that may not speak English, that may not speak English very well. But if you've got a lot of dance, if you've got animals, if you've got physical comedy, there's no language barrier to get over. And so that carries over very well into the silent film era, right? You get to the silent film era and vaudevillians are able to make that transition a lot easier. Um, but, you know, they um, then, but it still takes away from vaudeville, right? It still starts to, because if you, because if you record a vaudeville act once, you only have to pay them once. And then you can just distribute it, make copies, show things all over the place. But what vaudeville still gives you is that audio. You can still hear the songs. You can still hear the jokes and things like that. But when, as they say, talkies come along, mm-hmm. and the first recorded musical, Al Jolson, you know, the jazz singer, in 1927, that is what really, That's as what you said, really that kills vaudeville, vaudeville because you don't need to go see it live anymore. They can put the most amazing things on the screen, and for all intent and purposes, it's just like being there, right? You're seeing the image, you're hearing the songs, you're hearing the jokes and mm-hmm. things like that. So, so vaudeville, unfortunately, pretty much by the 1920s, as an art form, comes to an end, but it continues all the way through, really, to the present day. And then, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was, and also just references to vaudeville in early film, numerous. Because I think about, I, I love watching old movies and old TV shows, if you think of I Love Lucy, Fred and Ethel Mertz, the neighbors, they were a vaudeville act in the way back whens. And they still like to do their cute little song and dance numbers, but they do it, you know, on the TV show. So this is still something that's so ingrained in the American consciousness. Like it's ingrained, even though I've never seen a vaudeville show, uh, save the best for last, the, the hook coming off the, and pulling someone off yeah. the stage. All of this comes from vaudeville. It's so well ingrained in our culture that we just don't even think about it almost, that that's where it came from. Right, and you know, and, and some of the, the best comedy routines in history Absolutely. come straight from vaudeville. So <laughs> I'm going to guess that, that some of you out there may have seen this, but but as a, as a closer to our presentation, and then if we have any time left, we'll answer questions. 
But if you haven't seen this, you really need to. It, your life is not complete until you see one of the greatest back and forths in comedy in vaudeville history, Abbott and Costello, who's on first. I love baseball. Well, we all love baseball. When we get to St. Louis, will you tell me the guy's name's on the team so I go to see them in that St. Louis ballpark? I'll be able to know those fellas. Well, now, it's all right, folks. All right. Excuse me, I'm all right. I want to find out the fellas' names. As long as it's okay I'm, with the I'm audience. crazy about baseball. Uh, as long as, uh, will you stand still? Pick up your hat. Go pick up your hat. Okay. Now, look. Then you'll go and peddle your popcorn and don't interrupt the act anymore? Yes, sir. All right. But you know, strange may seem they give ball players nowadays very peculiar names. Funny names? Nicknames, pet not, names. Not as funny as my name, Sebastian Dinwiddie. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Funnier than that? Oh, absolutely. Woo! Yes. Now, on the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellas on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Do you know the fellas' well, names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean, the fellas' name on first base. Who? The fella playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who is on first? Have you got a first baseman on first? Certainly. Then who's playing first? Absolutely. When you pay off the first baseman every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. And why not? The man's entitled to it. Who is? Yes. So who gets it? Why shouldn't he? Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Who's wife? Yes. Mm. After all, the man earns it. Who does? Absolutely. Well, all I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? Oh, no, no, no. What is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, don't change the players. I'm not it. changing nobody. Now, take it easy. What's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. We're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. If I mention a third baseman's name, who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? Stay off of first, will you? Well, what do you want me to do? Now, what's the guy's name on third base? Well, what's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. There I go, back on third again. Well, I can't change their names. Will you please stay on third base, Mr. Broadhurst? Please. Now, what is it you want to know? What is the fella's name on third base? What is the fella's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. Woo! You got an outfield? Oh, sure. St. Louis has got a oh, good outfield? Absolutely. The left fielder's name. Why? I don't know. I just thought I'd ask you. Well, I just thought I'd tell you. Then tell me who's playing left field. Who is playing first? Stay out of the infield! Well, don't mention any names out here. I want to know what's the fellow's name in left field. What is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who is on first? I don't know. Third, Third base. base. Oh, take it easy. Take it easy, man. And the left fielder's name? Why? Because. Oh, he's center field. He's center. Will you pick up your hat, please? Pick up your hat and Whoa. stop this. Now, oh, look, Mr. please. Mr. Broadhurst. Yes. Wait a minute. You got a pitcher on a team? Wouldn't this be a fine team without a pitcher? I don't know. Tell me the pitcher's name. Tomorrow. You don't want to tell me the date? I'm telling you, man. Then go ahead. Tomorrow. What time? What time what? What time tomorrow are you going to tell me who's pitching? Now, listen. Who is not pitching? Who is on? I'll break your arm, you say. Who's on first? I come up here and ask. I want to know what's the pitcher's name. What's on second? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> you got a catcher? Yes. The catcher's name. Today. Today. And tomorrow's pitching. Now you've got it. That's all. St. Louis has got a couple of days on the team. Well, I can't help that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? Got a catcher? Yes. I'm a good catcher, too, you know. I know that. I would like to play for the St. Louis team. Well, I might arrange that. I, I would know. like to catch. Now, I'm being a good catcher. Tomorrow's pitching on the team, and I'm catching. Yes. Tomorrow throws the ball, and the guy up bunts the ball. Yes. Now, when he bunts the ball, me being a good catcher, I want to throw the guy out at first base, so I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now, that's the first thing you've said right. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Well, that's all you have to do. Is to throw it to first base. Yeah. Now, who's got it? Naturally. Who has it? Naturally. 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 Okay. Now you've got it. I pick up the ball and I throw it to natural. I know you he, don't. You throw the ball to first base. Then who gets it? Naturally. Okay. All right. I throw the ball to natural. You don't. You throw it to who? Naturally. Well, that's it. Say it that way. That's what I said. You did not. I said I throw the ball to natural. You don't. You throw it to who? Naturally. Yes. 
So I throw the ball to first base and naturally gets no, it. No, you throw the ball to first base. Then who gets naturally. it? Naturally. That's what I'm saying. You're not saying that. Excuse me, folks. All right, I'm sorry, Frank. I throw the ball to naturally. You throw it to who? Naturally. Naturally, we'll say it that way. That's what I'm saying. Don't get excited. Now, don't get I excited. I throw the ball to first base. Then who gets it? He better get it. All right, now, don't get excited. Take it easy. Hmm. Sure. Now, I throw the ball to first base. Whoever it is drops the ball so the guy runs to second. Mm -hmm. Who picks up the ball and throws it to what? What throws it? I don't know. I don't know. Throws it back to tomorrow. A triple play. Yeah, it could be. Another guy gets up and it's a long fly ball to be called. Why? I don't know. He's on third and I don't care. What was that? I said, I don't care. Oh, that's a shortstop. Here it I love baseball. Well, we all love baseball. When we get to St. Louis, will you tell me the guys' names on the team so I go to see them in that St. Louis ballpark? I'll be able to know those fellas. Well, now, it's all right, folks. All right. Excuse me. I'm all right. I want to find out the fellas. The greatest golden thing you'll ever see, folks. If you are not laughing at that, you probably need to just drop off of our channel. Um, <laughs> But, you know, that's the sort of entertainment you could get with vaudeville. And, again, it, it translated once once movies got sound, it translated great. So um, that's vaudeville in a nutshell. Uh, so if you all have any questions, we would be happy to to do our best to answer them about about anything we, we've talked about today um, with this with this great American uh, form of entertainment. question is, did Fred Astaire start out in vaudeville? I don't know specifically if he did, but I would be surprised if he didn't. Because I believe he did, but it did, he started at such a time where it seems like the transition had already almost gone to screen. So I don't think he was a big vaudeville star, but if he wasn't necessarily... Uh, I feel like he had to do at least a couple kind of vaudeville-esque shows, um, but there's not like a whole lot of documentation about that because that's not where he was a big star uh, by any means. And if not, he definitely trained and performed with vaudeville people. Absolutely, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know what they said about one of Fred Astaire's first auditions? Uh, he came in and then he left and the fellow made some notes. Uh, has a strange face, sings and dances a little. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I don't know. I want to say about, you know, depending on what time frame we're talking about, um, the vaudeville show would cost 20 cents, maybe something like that, 15 to 20 cents. It's really, it's for the average person. So it's not going to be ex oh, extravagantly <laughs> a lot of money <laughs> um, because it's, it's for the average person. Like, Glenn was saying earlier, it's a lot of the lower class working people, a lot of the immigrants who have just come to America um, want to go see these shows. A lot of times, also, I think we uh, were about to mention about the different stereotypes that were played. We um, talked about how people stereotyped African Americans, but vaudeville really went after anyone and everyone um, to a certain extent, uh, and sometimes that ended very poorly, uh, depending on how the audience received right. them. Uh, and depending on how the presentation was. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're at a live audience if they start to use accents, and they, they used costumes. They used Irish, you know, over-the-top costumes, Chinese, uh, African-American, German, and, but depending on how the performers would do it, right? You don't want, you don't want to hack off your audience. But if you can connect with your audience, even if even if what you're wearing or what you're presenting is a little bit stereotyped, the audience is going to buy into that and sort of at least recognize themselves to some extent to what they see on the screen, and that means they're going to come back. Perhaps. Or they're going to be very offended and start to throw things. Yeah, but but the cost of a vaudeville show is about what a movie costs now. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's priced very affordably. Um, were the audiences segregated or integrated? Good question. Were the audiences segregated? Generally, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes when, uh, when African Americans began to have numbers or have, have acts in the show, then that would draw in a lot of African American viewers. And, you know, again, the theaters technically were segregated on paper, but when you start having a lot of African Americans come to the shows, 
if you turn if they fill up the the African if they fill up the the Negro section, but there's still people outside, you're not making money. So a lot of the bigger theaters against the law started allowing them to come in and fill up the white section so that they could get the ticket sales and they and they continue to do that. So so on paper by the law, yes, the theaters the shows were segregated in seating. In or there reality, would be one show where it would be like all white people and then there would be one show where it was all African American right. people. But but yeah, in practice, um, those theater people are more like I said, they're worried about about selling seats mm-hmm. and however they can get the most from selling the seats they're gonna do. Also that. with the acts, sometimes as they allowed African Americans to actually portray themselves. Uh, it got to be, well, how many African American acts do you allow in the show? Because there's only a certain number of acts. So sometimes, even though there's these incredibly talented people, you're limited to only one or two slots out of the whole show where you're allowed to have a performer of color. Right. Did vaudeville have a presence in Europe, or did it start there? It d- it did. We think. Uh, you know, did, did vaudeville start in Europe? Uh, sort of, yes. The root of the word, there's a couple of different versions of, of, of how the, the word vaudeville came about. There's one that's uh, from the French, voix de ville, the voice of the city, because a lot of these shows, again, it's, it's a variety show, and of course Europe had variety shows. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but European variety shows are going to pull from from European styles of entertainment, right? It's going to be, you know, European songs and things like that. And and a French variety show is mostly going to have um, French culture performances because their audience is almost exclusively French. The, the interesting thing about American vaudeville is because they're having to, to cater to and appeal to a much broader audience in terms of, of, of race and culture and things like that, American vaudeville becomes much more eclectic than than European vaudeville. And and so they did have vaudeville in Europe, but not remotely like they had it here in the, in the States. There's also uh, performers who were of, of color, like the Nicholas Brothers, who ended up going to France, who where laws were much more lax and integration was much more celebrated uh or it wasn't as segregation was not as stringent perhaps and, uh, it was and, more and, and in some ways non-existent exactly right? uh to where they the nicholas brothers for a good portion of their year went to france because they felt like they had more opportunity there than they did in america and that happened as a, as a side note with a lot of the african-american soldiers that fought with american forces in world war one they got to france and realized there is no segregation in french towns and a lot of folks went and went back to France after the war. But that that's another that's another broadcast. That's a World Sorry. War I broadcast. <laughs> uh, do you know if the piano players would write their own music or uh-huh. was it no music? Ah, so yeah, good question. So would the piano players write their own music or was or was it tunes? Um, for some of the um, you know, if it's a it's a live vaudeville show, they're going to rehearse the show with with their performers. If you're talking about some of the silent movies that come in a lot of the silent movies come with a score mm-hmm. that the piano player is supposed, or the pipe organ player, the keyboard player, let's say, is supposed to play along with the movie so that the dramatic parts can go dun 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 dun, and you know then and then the love scenes are slow and things like that. So most of them did come with a score, and you know the the movie is 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 a movie it's on a reel but the piano player is performing live every single time so maybe those first few times he sees the movie he's not able to keep up with it at all cuz he's having to play the keyboard or she some some of them were she um play the keyboard look at the notes and then look at the screen and make sure that they're getting everything right when they go through so it's a it's a very busy kind of job but after they've seen the movie a couple of times they know exactly how the music's supposed to follow along and also for vaudeville performances some people who were if they were doing like a song and dance number or just a song number or if they were going to play an instrument and sing sometimes there are there are quote unquote like vaudeville songs like they would write their own song and they would perform it and then sometimes if they got really popular well then they became like a vaudeville song and then other people would try to mimic them and for to perform it and i don't think copyright laws were exactly existent to that extent uh at that time so 
the idea of like stealing acts or being an impersonator uh where you're basically you're stealing someone's act but saying that you're impersonating them uh happened but there are a lot of people who got up there and sang and danced and for some reason and i'm not necessarily sure why perhaps you know why the ukulele became the biggest hit it's a dainty little instrument of but they were so big in vaudeville <laughs> the ukulele hit its heyday in vaudeville <laughs> i'm not necessarily sure why perhaps that's like when us i i think it's actually right when us right after us acquired hawaii as a territory Ma- maybe and therefore yeah, there know. was a fascination with hawaii and hawaiian culture and then the ukulele just because it's a small instrument, it's easy to carry around, and as you travel from town to town, perhaps it's easy to play as you sing. And You're also, not having to do chords and everything, right? Uh, to quote the documentary I was watching about how that that was mentioning this ukulele, you don't necessarily have to play the ukulele well; you just have to play it enthusiastically. <laughs> uh, we're wondering how did people acquire elephants and baboons? Oh. Uh, so, yeah, how did people acquire the uh, the exotic animals for vaudeville? A lot of those acts come from the circus, right? This is also uh, a little bit before the Civil War, but especially after, traveling circuses are all the rage. They're another great form of spectacle. And, and this really is when there would be a, a circus train or a circus wagon train, and they would go from town to town. They would have to set up the huge tents, and they would have these trained animals. And... A lot of those people sort of got tired of having to always be on the road. And, and, you know, the animals did not wear well when they're on the road. So they thought, well, if we can set up in a theater, then we're able to stay in one place. We have, you know, a couple of shows a day instead of having to be on the road and and have four or five shows every evening. Um, So a lot of them came from the circus, really. It's it's, it's the... (laughs) It, it's it's the it's the same business, right? They can go with the circus. They can go with vaudeville. How many would there be a vaudeville theater in basically every town or just cities? Mm. That's a good question. Would there be a vaudeville uh, theater in every town or city? It's there were theaters, right? There were theaters, and the theaters could sort of uh, think of it as as we have when we say the theater now, like for plays. They're very specifically only for plays. We usually don't have plays in the same place that we show movies, right? Mm-hmm. There's the movie theater, there's the performance theater. That was not the case back then. You had a theater and you would bring in anything you could to fill seats. And there would be, uh, you know, you might, again, as, as these vaudeville troops travel around the country, you might bring one in and, and set them up for, for a week or two and have them do that. And then the next week, if you've purchased the equipment, you might show a movie, you might show both. And and it's interesting because as movies came in, um, it became a little bit cheaper to buy the equipment to show the movie than it did to pay the troops of multiple, multiple people coming through. And so like so many other technologies, the technologies start to not kill, but, but certainly have a damper on large troops of people traveling for entertainment purposes and technology does that frequently right it, it happened um, it happened with vaudeville uh rap actually hurt funk as, as, as a sort of side note right funk bands were awesome but a funk band would have 20 people in it with the instrument players and the background singers and things like that and so when they're traveling doing their gigs um you know if a if a techno person or, or a rap group came through there's only three of them and so you're having you're able to pay them a lot less, so you book more of them. Whereas these traveling funk bands that you have to pay twenty people at a time, you're not going to book them as much. Same thing with vaudeville. It's easier to buy the equipment and get a reel in and show a movie for a week than it is to pay a twenty or twenty five person troop coming through with vaudeville. So it really start the technology starts to have a damper severely on the live performance issues. But in bigger cities, some would have dedicated vaudeville theaters. That was their bread and butter. That's what they did. Not to say that's necessarily all they did, that they didn't bring in other things, but they were pretty much dedicated to vaudeville. And there would be these circuits that you would travel around the country. Very much like today with touring groups, there's different circuits that you hit with different cities that you hit. And that's how some 
these vaudeville performers did it and they would ride around these circuits like these traveling everyone owned a certain theater here there and elsewhere this person owned all of them you signed up with them you hit all of them uh and if you missed them they'll be back in six months yes so it's uh does it the touring has not changed all that much depending on uh what kind of touring you're looking at but it's kind of like how you know Someone has di- decided to go do a tour of the United States and this band, and it, same thing with vaudeville. They, if you were big enough and ha- were a big enough star, you could go and you could do the whole circuit. If not, if you're just trying to get started, you would go find your local vaudeville theater and see if they would put you in their lineup, and if your act was good enough. Then you were on your way. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there any way to listen to vaudeville acts at home during, uh, or when did that start? Uh. So... Sort of. That's why I have this really oh. neat little thing here. Where is it? Was it possible to see or view vaudeville acts from home? Or here. Or here. Of course, no, you had to go there until, again, technology starts to play a role. What if someone, let's say the inventor of the light bulb, comes up with a machine that records <laughs> sound and music that allows you to simply take it back and play it at home? And I mentioned before, this is in the time before we could just put in a CD or turn on the radio. But this is the beginning of you know, machines, and, 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 and Edison was the first one with his labs, not he, but some of the people that worked for him, to create means to record sound, record songs, and you could just play them over and over. And most of them were wind up, and they would turn, and this is the first one. This is an edison a phone cylinder, so it comes in this cardboard um, thing, and you can see it's, this one's actually for the French market, Les Cylindres, cylindres Registres Edison. And I will be very gentle with this as I take it out. And most of you probably know what a record is. Uh, The little black plastic thing that you can put and a needle you put on the record and the grooves in it sort of replicate the sound. This works on the same principle, but it's first and it's a cylinder. So you put the cylinder onto a thing like this and then you put the needle down and the cylinder turns this way. And it's got grooves just like a record has grooves going around it. This has grooves on the cylinder, and it can play the songs. It can it can play, and and they would put all sorts of things on this at first: um, songs, speeches, uh, important news broadcasts, or things like that. But but of course, this is this is from this one is actually from the National Vaudeville Company uh, here in the History Center collections. So it was possible if if there was a very popular tune, and they were able to. Rep- if, well, I would say if Edison was able to get a hold of it and mm. thought he could make some money reproducing it and selling it, then it could make its way into your own home. Well, one of our viewers, uh, their grandfather's cousin was a silent movie theater piano player. Oh, cool. Oh, c- super cool. <laughs> um, to Louisa. <laughs> Thanks, Louisa. Um, uh, we don't have any other questions. Do y'all want us? Uh, could you speak to the influences that you've seen vaudeville in modern times? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, do you want to go first? So as we were watching that Who's On First video, I r- thought about what was the first time I ever remembered hearing Who's On thir- First. It was actually in my elementary school talent show. And I then I thought, <laughs> talent shows are pretty much just vaudeville. Good point. Yeah. Because, you know, I was about to get up and do my little dance number. These two guys were doing the Alvin and Costello Who's On First. There were a bunch of people who were going to sing, you know, one of our little friends was going to, you know, chop a board in half. <laughs> like, right. it, it, talent it's, shows it's are basically vaudeville. vaudeville. Yeah. <laughs> so I was thinking it, it, it kind of still exists today to, yeah. a, to a certain extent. Um, but I also talked about, you know, I Love Lucy, Fred and Ethel Mertz, um, all vaudeville referenced back to the uh, – in the 1950s, referencing back to, you know, the vaudeville days. And right. I think that was probably my first I, time I actually had heard the word vaudeville. I mean, you know, and, and um, like I said, the, the, the comedy has always had it for me because you can see it going all the way back. And, and honestly, stand-up comedy, you know, when you, when you go see uh, a show, or a stand-up comic or, or a group of stand-up comics, that's a piece of vaudeville. Of course, vaudeville had more jugglers and animals and things like that. But stand-up comedy is vaudeville. It, it's a very specific part that has been pulled up. 
and it's and it's so great. You know, who's on first? That you've got the duo, you've got the singles doing the one liners. Sometimes you don't need words like the the guys hitting each other with one guy's got a sack full of black coal and one guy's got a sack full of flour, and they're just, just flailing back and forth and hilarious. Um, but you know, it it's it creating those acts that appealed to a wide audience had such a huge influence on uh, going into silent films. Like, you know, there's always Charlie Chaplin, but, but for my money, Buster Keaton is just by far the funniest guy. And when you go back and watch his stuff, he was a true craftsman. And he, was, he basically was telling vaudeville, not telling, showing vaudeville comedy with the new medium of film, which allowed him a huge new way to kind of tell the story with, you know, cut scenes and things like that, that, that made it even funnier than he, and, and, and a scale much broader, but the jokes are vaudeville jokes, right? Um, and, you know, even in the early days of television, the, some of the first most successful television shows were variety shows. You've, you know, Milton Berle mm-hmm. and, and uh, George and Gracie. Carol um, Burnett. Carol Burnett. Oh, God, Carol, Carol Burnett. Burnett. So good. So good. And, and But it's a variety show. It's a variety show. Uh, uh, and, you know, even uh, even up to today, we, they're not as – variety shows are unfortunately not quite as popular well, today. But, but if you want to say perhaps Saturday Night Live, you have a musical act, you have sketch comedy. I mean, it's not a, a true – vaudeville performance necessarily but you could see remnants of that yeah and and the and the classic one-liner jokes that we all know you know guy goes to a doctor's office he says it hurts when i do this the doctor says don't do that (laughs) that's vaudeville you know (laughs) if you had a quarter in one pocket and a quarter in the other pocket what would you have somebody else's pants (laughs) you know take my wife please it's all vaudeville jokes right it's that it's that classic comedy that just continues to build on and 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 uh, even though Mister again, we need to do it. We need to do a live stream on, on minstrel shows because that is such a fascinating topic. And goes but, is so ingrained in our culture that we don't realize it with hurtful stereotypes and cons- going forward. Yeah, but for it, everything, very hurtful, very racist. But for its time, it for decades it was the, the most, most popular, popular form of entertainment, and that goes into vaudeville. And I think. Um, in the refined vaudeville, it, you know, may have gotten cleaned up, but taking the blackface and some some of the stereotypes out of it, again, the entertainment and and the stories are still there, and they're just they're so entertaining. And vaudeville served as that that bridge between uh, you know minstrelsy and sort of isolated pockets of different kinds of entertainment, brought them all into one big bundle. And that bundle has sort of carried forward in all the other mediums that we that we know and love today. That's all the time we're going to take uh, out of your wonderful Friday for today. Uh, thanks again for joining us uh, to learn a little bit more about vaudeville here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. I'm Glenn. I'm Marie. And we will see you again soon. If you can make a donation, please do. Um, but you're already digital members, or if yeah, you could always gift one if you wanted to. If you think someone would enjoy these. Why not buy them a membership? That's right. They're awesome. All right, folks, have a great weekend, and we will see you soon.